We are turning the clock back now to 2017 slash 18 when the Me Too movement was front and center in our nation. Little did Seattle writer Geraldine DeReuter know that sharing some hard truths while making some bad cinnamon rolls would end up winning her a James Beard Award. She was on New Day right before being named the winner for Best Personal Essay. So Mario Batelli wrote uh, an apology uh, mm -hmm. for some bad behavior of his, and mm -hmm. he embedded in that statement a recipe for cinnamon rolls, yeah. which was odd, I thought. You wrote about it, and, and I thought brilliantly with great oh, irony you. and insight. I laughed. I was, I was, there's something between a tragic comedy where you're <laughs> laughing, crying kind of thing. Um, tell me about what you wrote and what happened. And I'm like, all right, he's apologized. He's sorry. And we take it at face value. And then I saw this recipe. And I kind of took that at face value. Oh, he says it's a great recipe. And I was like, no, this is ridiculous. Like, the inclusion of it is absurd. It kind of trivializes everything that people have gone through because of his actions and also his apology itself. And then as I was staring at this recipe, you know, I've done a, a fair amount of baking in my time, and I thought, there's no way that this recipe is a good recipe. Uh, so I you decided... You did not take the little offering that he I did that he not. Gave. She did not. And a lot has happened since 2018, and now Geraldine is out with a brand new book. It's called If You Can't Take the Heat, Tales of Food, Feminism, and Fury, and Geraldine joins me now. Hello, friend. Hi. This is exciting. Yeah, it has been a wild ride since that interview <laughs> and you were like it's so hard to look back on that. I mean it's oh, such yeah. a trip right <laughs> it is so did that kind of first cinnamon roll moment spark this book uh, yeah I mean that was sort of a pivotal moment so I I write that essay and I get a ton of press for it but I also get a ton of backlash yeah. so I'm getting like hate mail I'm getting death threats oh my god about a blog post about cinnamon rolls Death threats. Death threats. That's terrifying. No, it is incredibly strange. But the thing is, it, it set up an important point, which is it doesn't matter what you write about. Right. If you are visible, you're going to get hate. If you're expressing any kind of opinion, you're going to get hate. Right. So after that, I, I started actually talking to a lot of these people who were sending me this hate mail. You did? Yeah, terrible idea. Never well, done I've never done that. No, believe do me, I've gotten a few it. unfortunate emails a time or two, and believe yeah. me, I did not respond. Oh but. yeah, do not do it. It's a terrible idea. I talk about that in the book <laughs> as well. Okay. But uh, uh, a few years later, I ended up writing another post that went incredibly viral, mm -hmm. and it was about this ill-fated dinner experience I had in Italy. And that ended up being on the homepage of the New York Times. Stephen Colbert did a segment on wow. it. So it completely exploded. And once again, the same thing happened. Right. I was getting a ton of hate mail. And the chef himself uh, did some really disturbing stuff. What? Yeah, so he took footage of me and then spliced it with sexually explicit content and put it on his Instagram feed. So, okay, it, that's terrifying. It was. And violating yeah. and all of the things. Oh my gosh. You know, yeah. one would think that after all of this, you'd be like, no thanks, I'm good. You know what, I'm just gonna, but you haven't. You've kept talking and, <laughs> and now you have this book. Yeah. It's so interesting that every time something has happened, food has been kind of, I don't know, the premiere in which you have served up your opinion. So why is food such an excellent vehicle for discussing things like feminism? Well, I think food is an excellent vehicle to discuss anything, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, we, we eat, or we should eat, at least three times a day. Yeah. So it's a huge component of our lives. But then if you think about the relationship that food has to feminism, it's huge, right? One of the few places where women have ever been allowed to kind of mm -hmm. reign supreme or have any measure of control has been in the kitchen. Right. At the same time, they've kind of been just relegated to that Like, you can't leave well. that space. Exactly. And then when the the people who have done so well in that space, like, publicly or have been successful at it, or, or have been men, male chefs. Exactly. And then you're starting to see, there was almost like, even during the Me Too movement, there was so much toxicity yeah. in the food world, and it went unchecked for so long. 
Absolutely. We sort of accepted it as, oh, this is what chefs are like. You know, they're intense, they're fiery. And it's like, no, that, that's not true. They're actually being abusive and we shouldn't stand for that. And we should start questioning it. And we should also start questioning why so many professional chefs, so many awarded chefs right. are men, whereas so much of the burden of mm -hmm. home cooking goes to women. Like Gordon Ramsay's whole thing his whole entire brand is based off of being a mean, abusive guy. Yeah. And I remember my mother, she went to culinary school. She was a makeup artist for film and television for many years. Excuse my side story. She went to culinary school, uh -huh. started working in these kitchens and was like, no, I, I get treated way better doing the other thing. People were treated, she's like, I don't like how I'm treated. So this is, this is a situation where people are, are saying, I don't want to be in this industry. Do you think though that we're an immune to um, I don't know, some of the like the snobbery of fine dining in Seattle, do you think that we're more down to earth here or is a lot of that toxicity permeating even in our town? Well, so I do think that the toxicity is here, right? And mm -hmm. we've seen that. We've seen quite a few stories of local chefs who have committed absolute atrocities. Right. So that part is absolutely true. In terms of are we immune to the snobbery of fine dining? I think that's slightly a different question. And I'd like to think that we are because we are such a laid back, sweatpants kind of town. Right. So I do hope that we maintain that. And I also think coming with that, you know, being able to say, well, fine dining isn't that big a deal. I think it also means that we hold chefs to a higher standard because we don't put them on a pedestal. Right. So I hope we keep doing that. I hope we keep calling out bad behavior. I think that's really smart. I want to get back to the book really quickly and just ask you how it's organized. These are a bunch of essays, right? They are. So it's a bunch of personal essays, but within each one, I try and talk about a larger sort of thematic experience mm -hmm. that I think pertains to everyone almost. So I talk about the pressure of going out on a date and who's going to pay for the meal yeah. and the expectation that comes with that. And obviously, if someone buys you dinner, it doesn't mean anything. Right. But then there is this idea of, if I do let him buy me dinner, does it become a date? And then mm -hmm. have I changed the dynamic somehow? And so I explore that. And within that, I also talk about the concept of ladies' menus, mm -hmm. which are menus that don't have prices. That still exists. They do. Excuse the fact that I don't do a lot of fine dining with my <laughs> life, but that really exists still? Yeah, they're few and far between in the United States because of a lawsuit that happened in the early 1980s, which I talk about in the book. But if you go to certain restaurants, and primarily in Europe is where I yeah. encountered it, I received menus that didn't have prices. And at one point, we inquired about it, and I was told by the maitre d', women don't like to think about money. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Uh -huh. That's a hard one. It is a hard one when you look globally. I mean, okay. I just, I, I got to say, I am really so inspired by the fact that you continued to talk despite the negative reaction that you continue to share these stories and speak your truth. The last topic that you actually wanted to cover with the comment section of any food site. Um, it's truly, you say, an unhinged place. Why is this so? And what is it about food recipes that make people a bonkers? You know, I think we all have such a deeply personal relationship with food. It's so important to us. And at the same time, I think it's this thing that we can fight about that's almost almost a safe zone to uh, scream okay. about, all right. right? Like if we're fighting about a mac and cheese recipe, or if we're fighting about, I don't know, a chocolate chip cookie recipe, there's some safety there because it's not about politics. Right. It's, it's not about anything terribly serious. It's just about the food. Not a pinch of salt, darn it. Oh no, a teaspoon at least. I can't even talk oh, about I this. I love extra salt in my <laughs> sweets. I love extra salt <laughs> in my desserts. Um, this is so fascinating to me, and I just, I, I really can't wait to dive in deeper into the book. It's so fun. You can't take, if you can't take the heat. Um, and just a reminder, by the way, you can actually hear Geraldine speak in person at her event at Town Hall on Friday, April 5th. Head to the Town Hall website for her ticket info. Thank you, Geraldine. Thank you for having of me. Of course.